think, I think what's interesting in the newspaper is that it helps to connect stories and people from places in Kashmir to people in places in Kerala. It creates that kindred spirit among all of us where we feel like we are one country, we are one nationality. And even in the context of the last talk that we heard when we are looking at the Indian identity, it's very important to try to individually grasp what it is that is shaping that in Indian or that individual identity. So I want to share with you a little bit about a friend of mine. Um, and he, I met him, interestingly, through Facebook. And this is when um, I was editing a magazine which was based on uh, this is particularly when um, things were, there was a lot of uh, political upheaval in Afghanistan and people were trying to grapple with the situation, but also trying to grapple with uh, post 9-11, the perceptions that we have about turban people or people with beards, or why is it that we automatically perceive them to be terrorists or people with negative agendas. So for me, it was a personal exercise in being able to overcome some of those stereotypes, being able to overcome them through visual mediums, through first-hand accounts of people that are living, walking, have run, uh, are refugees from or are based in different parts of uh, Afghanistan. And I found uh, an interesting, it was a photo gallery that was uh, the only photo gallery, I think, at that time. I'm sure there are many more now that was available on Facebook called Afghan Photographers. Ironically, most of them were not from Afghanistan, but people that had visited, professionals, people working in the UN, or other aid agencies. And uh, he uh, he has a very interesting background. He was um, is a professional photographer and videographer, based was based in Australia. He he used to do, in fact, I mean, if there are Metallica fans here, he shot different Metallica videos. He worked with um, produ uh, mu um, film directors like. Wonka Rai, he'd been to different parts of the world, was working very much within uh, that section of the industry. But when, um, in 2004, when the tsunami hit um, Indonesia, something changed and he decided maybe just give it a shot. So he went to Indonesia, a volunteer there, almost died in Indonesia because he got so sick. But then once he recovered, he moved to India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, different parts, um, different countries around, different sorts of aid, humanitarian work. But what's really interesting about his way of doing that work was through, cre um, through linking digital mediums, film, photography, creating films. So it's interesting how he would be armed with a camera, not armed with anything else. And he was creating all these stories, taking these stories to people in different parts of the world. Um, he has a very interesting story in Kabul, where he's based right now. And uh, in Kabul, he w he started, he was one of the founders of a very, very, I think, inspiring program. It's the only program of its kind called Skatistan. So it's a skate park created in Kabul. They're opening another one, I think, uh, close by soon. And uh, this is an image, if you look carefully, it doesn't look like a very ex extraordinary image, but it is because it shows boys and girls in the, st <coughs> sorry, in the streets of Kabul, skating, skateboarding, having fun. And this won the Peace and Sport Image of the Year um, Award in 2011. <coughs> this is uh, the logo of Skatistan. And it's one of the organizations internationally that I am very uh, motivated to see and to see what it's doing and where it's based and the kind of impact that it has. Um, moving ahead, uh, what, uh, what I interpret interpreted through the theme of Now What? And some of the stories that I would like to share now are all based on this concept of s different individuals or different groups of individuals who realized the potential of technology, saw that it had hit some point, and then realized that there's so much more that they could do. So these examples that I'm about to share that I'm going to go through fairly quickly, I hope that maybe on, on your own time, on your own computers, you can access them more or take a look at the kind of work that they do. But these are people that realize now what? And they've created some really unique, edgy, interesting, cutting edge concepts in terms of what they are doing online for community mobilization, working with issues from um, LGBT rights to uh, uh, environmental uh, awareness, different kinds of issues, and how they are doing the work that they're doing, but using digital mediums. And what for me personally is very interesting is that when I work in Delhi, a lot of people don't understand that sometimes there's a very direct connection between the work that I do directly when I'm sitting with a group of children and the work that I'm doing when I'm doing it online on my computer. And it's very difficult sometimes to justify that 
connection but what's i think extremely positive is that we are now moving into a i think we're moving into a space we're moving into a time where some of these connections are becoming a lot clearer people are beginning to value the the impact of projects such as the one that we launched last month online this is a particularly interesting project for me it's the voice project it's based in uganda and um it brings together bands together women widows rape survivors abductees previous who are previous abductees or, or people that are living in idp camps and uh, what the women they are doing is so unique because they are coming together and they are coming together through music and through songs and this is a very interesting website that helps to share what they are doing in uganda internationally a peace movement is an incredible thing so this is what the voice project is really about um another aspect to um to how particularly women and i'll touch upon that a little bit more are being able to break um they're being able to break some forms of repression forms of silence particularly where so much truth is silenced around gender issues around women's issues um the internet particularly blogging has become a really interesting means of women being able to be heard and their voices being able to be heard everybody knows about what happened in egypt the revolution in egypt what a lot of people don't know about is this website this is torture in egypt torture in egypt is a blog that was set up by a, a woman a young woman whose name is noha atif and she was one of the first people and one of the first women who pioneered blogging in egypt and what was very interesting is that she went against um the political setup there what she essentially does through her blog is to highlight and share real stories of um different cases of torture and for example one of the really interesting things that she does or she used to do through the blog is highlight cases where the police were perpetrators of violence and the funny thing is she would find these cases specifically by looking at police that were being given awards or that were being recognized for bravery and valor and then linking them back with recognizing how those same police were responsible for perpetrating the, the exact same forms of violence that they were supposedly standing up against and be embraced for who they are gay lesbian bi transgender or straight we need you to go to all out to build this historic movement for equality will you join us and again this is very interesting if you've been following the news in this last week itself and it's an email that i received in the morning um in light of what's happening in the us with the um the two bills sopa and pipa it uh, how many people are aware that wikipedia went down on wednesday lots of people are aware and what was particularly interesting about uh, when wikipedia went down was uh, this phrase where they said imagine a world without free knowledge so it's still actually i just checked in fact it's still on the website they have a banner on the top of the website imagine a world without free mo uh, free knowledge 162 million people last week saw this message um asking them to imagine this kind of world and even for me personally it's very difficult to imagine what life would be without being able to access information that we do the way we do today and i'll be coming back to this point a little bit more within the indian context um and what's happening with how certain websites are trying to be curtailed and how people are responding to that so zuckerberg um from facebook also said the internet is the most powerful tool we have for creating a more open and connected world take back the tech another really cool example of uh, what um women and men have done to raise awareness around um gender based issues but particularly gender based violence against women and it focuses on how women take charge of technology and um it's based sort of it functions only during the 16 days of activism which just ended uh, i think a month ago it's sorry in in november to december get up um focusing a little bit more on political rights and civil rights uh, it's an australian based uh, movement they have Uh, many people following it and it's an internationally recognized social mo movement phenomenon with more members than all the country's political parties combined 
which is an interesting fact to observe. And they aim to build an accountable and progressive Australia with everyday people. Uh, the next point that I, I want to talk about a little bit more is um, centered around dissident politics or politics of dissent. When coming back to the point about how newspapers, I think one of the interesting things why newspapers are the most consumed, they are also the most contrived. And um, everything from the images that we see in a newspaper to the vid to the videos that we see on uh, on channels online or channels on the television, they are ex everything to a degree or to a massive degree is very manipulated and what I think is very empowering through the internet and through certain more regulated websites or ways of accessing information on the internet is that we are able to access the other side to this information. Uh, another point is also that given the way the economy is changing, there's so much more money in circulation now and it helps people like you or people like me through different campaigns, different online campaigns, um, websites to as citizens make contributions towards what we think humanitarian change should be or what we think social justice in our own nations or in the world should be. So some very interesting examples are these three websites. There are many more, but these are three particularly interesting ones. Global Giving, um, they have a phenomenal number of donors that have donated money through this website to a phenomenal number of organizations and projects. And uh, Global Giving, they come regularly to India as well, conducting workshops. I've been for one of their workshops last year, where they help to enable grassroots-based organizations to use platforms such as this, trying to bridge that gap often that exists between organizations and not being able to access platforms such as these. CrowdRise is another one. Uh, Kickstarter is another one. You could post any project. It could be TEDx Mica itself that you posted on Kickstarter. Um, tell the world how much money you need and people from different parts of the world, uh, individuals, companies, can donate money to your cause. Um, ch how many people have uh, seen different petitions that have been coming out on change.org? Okay, so change.org is a very interesting someone in the back organization where anyone, anywhere, can set up a petition for a cause that they think is important. So its causes are so wide ranging, I mean, you should check it out. Um, and they have a very, very inspirational founder as well, um, someone who you can follow online also. And he says that these tools are not that complicated. Change.org founder Ben Rattray said, downplaying the innovation part of technology, social change is less about the tools and more about the application of those tools. And here I again want to reiterate the point about how having a vision, having an idea of what you want that change to be is I think is, is the first step. It doesn't really matter what the method is that you use, but not having that vision is sometimes, I think, where a lot of young people in colleges and in um, universities in India fall behind. This is change.org. Anyone can set up a petition, get thousands of people to follow you, um, and build social momentum through that online. Uh, do people here read the news or read articles on Kafila? Same person in the back, okay. Um, this is an, uh, this is a very interesting website. And this they are openly, um, they have articles that could constitute what one can call politics of dissent or the dis dissident news. Uh, I've highlighted this particular one. It's one that I really liked, again, within the context of what's happening in terms of how information is being curtailed in ways that a lot of us are not even aware of. And this is something you should check out. It came out um, in Jan and uh, January 2012. And it talks about how um, there's one line in this, it's still stuck in my mind about how if uh, censorship, the way that it's being um, thought out and planned out now, does actually take place, India will be under uh, in a state of more censorship than existed in Russia under Stalin. And it's a, I think it's a frightening reality to grapple with and one that people are not doing enough to stop or to block. This is something I'm sure everybody um, tweeted about, Facebooked about. Um, this is again, uh, just to highlight again, the ambit of the issues that they look at. Uh, another point that I wanted to touch upon a little bit, it's um, something that I think could have a lot of potential and could do a lot in a country like India, particularly because we have so many conflict-ridden zones. There are some very interesting um, organizations doing work in parts of Africa. 
where they are helping to track conflict in real time. So for example, okay, I'll come to it in a bit. There's, an, uh, there's uh, the LRA, Lord's Resistance Army. So there are, there's an organization that's helping to track what they are doing, where they are moving, um, which villages or which settlements are coming under attack, and being able to tell people, warn people, and warn people in time, and warn them in real time. Uh, Avaz is another great organization to check out. They are the world's largest political movement, with 9 million members operating in 14 languages across issues such as what's happening in Syria, um, awareness around democracy and reclaiming democracy, uh, environmental issues. Purpose, again, another great organization, and it has a, just the image I think is, is, is so interesting to look at. And Purpose creates 21st century movements with a firm belief, again, in the collective power of individuals of millions of people who are accessing this media across the globe. This is the example um, about cyber tracking and cyber mapping. And just to end, I just want to come back um, to the same point about having, uh, having a vision of change. And um, one of the key points that I mean that I would like to raise is that a lot of the individuals and people that we meet, especially when we sit at the threshold of uh, beginning a venture of our own or going out and doing something of our own, there's a lot of fear that sets in in terms of, especially with people I have met who have brilliant ideas and brilliant initiatives, but thinking that it won't be possible to execute them in real time or in real life. So this is just, it's a word of encouragement that I would like to end on saying that, um, speaking from my own experience, but also from the experience of a lot of other people that are heavily involved in some of the initiatives that I have highlighted through the presentation and many, many more that I've not highlighted, is to really think about how and redefine similarly as we were looking at redefining our identity, but to redefine the vision that we have for the country that we live in, for the cities that we live in, for the communities that we live in, recognizing, coming back to the first point again, that we live in shared communities. We don't live as individuals alone. And having that vision, having that foresight, developing that foresight, not having the fear to build that foresight is where brilliance comes from. It's where some of the fantastic initiatives that I have the privilege of knowing directly or of highlighting here have developed from. So that's my word of encouragement to everybody here. Thank you.